Hi there, Dr. Bruce. Hey, how are you? I'm well, let me just make, make sure the audio is working. I'm doing well. Can you see and hear me okay? Yeah, I can see you fine. All right, okay. perfectly. I'm going to just make you... Um, Do you want me to put earphones in? It's totally up to you. Whatever works. I don't have mine in. Um, I'm going to turn... I'm going to make you a co-host here. Yeah, that'd be great. There we go. All right, let's see. There we go. Awesome. Yeah. So you can see and hear me all right? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Cool. So I've invited people to join us live. So I, I imagine um, some people are joining in now and we may have- There's 11 people, it looks like. Yeah, we may have a few more people kind of joining us along the way. I've got a, a bunch of questions that people sent in ahead of time as well. So I'm gonna invite people to ask questions live yeah. and we'll do you know some questions that people sent in ahead of time. So thanks for being here. Oh yeah, it's my pleasure. Happy to happy to do it. Now's the time that people need the education. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what I'm going to do here is I just I want to welcome first of all everyone that's here. Thanks for coming today. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Melissa Kerner, and I'm the founder of uh, HealthyBodyHealthyLife.com, and I hope everyone is safe and well. So um, I'm excited to do this call with Dr. Bruce. He is you know one of the leading experts um, on sleep. And I met him a couple of years ago at a holistic health conference, and uh, he's very, very knowledgeable about how to get amazing sleep. He's got some great resources. So the plan for today really is, I'm going to just invite Dr. Bruce just to say a little bit about himself for those of you that don't know who he is and what he does. And then um, I'm going to invite him to just talk a little bit about uh, a little bit about sleep and how it actually affects your immune system and why it's so important to get sleep, especially now. And then I'll invite him to share some tips and then we'll dig into the Q&A. So um, what I'll invite you to do, there is a chat box on your screen. Okay. I'm gonna invite people to just post their questions there okay. in the chat box. And I'm gonna try to alternate between live questions and questions that uh, people sent in ahead of time. And please, uh, if you could just keep your lines muted just so that we can eliminate all background noise, that would be really helpful. So Dr. Bruce, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna give you the floor if you could okay. just tell people who you are, you sure. know what what you know what you do, and mm -hmm. um, and then we'll we'll get into some tips and some Q and A. Absolutely. So yeah. first of all, thanks for having me. Yes. Um, and it's it's my pleasure and honor to be able to grace your community. So thanks for giving me this opportunity to share. Um, so first of all, just to give you a little bit of background on me, my name is Dr. Michael Bruce. I have a PhD in clinical psychology and I'm board certified in clinical sleep disorders. So I took the medical board without going to medical school and passed. I'm one of 168 people that have ever done that. Wow. And um, I'm a really good test taker. I'm not some crazy <laughs> genius, just to be clear, okay? I'm a really good test taker. Um, and um, I've been an actively practicing sleep specialist for 22 years. So I've really seen everything you can possibly imagine when it comes to sleep. My general philosophical bend is away from pharmaceuticals. That's probably because of my uh, PhD background and clinical psychology background. I feel like there's a lot, especially in the sleep universe, that we can get accomplished without having to get into that whole pharmaceutical universe. To be fair, there are plenty of people who are appropriately using sleeping medication. So I'm not saying no to all sleep meds. I'm just saying there's a lot of steps that we can take before we get there. And that's kind right. of my general philosophy. Right. Um, uh, uh, let's see, what else can I tell you about me? Um, I have a website, it's called thesleepdoctor.com. Um, I do a tremendous amount of national media. I've been on the Dr. Oz show 39 times, it's ridiculous. Um, so so um, I do a lot of national media and a lot of outreach and a lot of education. And so this is very familiar to me to do these types of things. So again, thanks for having me on board. Um, and I figured I'd just launch right into how does sleep and immunity affect one another. If that's yeah, that idea. sounds great. Yeah. So here's the thing that's awesome about my topic <laughs> is not only does everybody either do it or not do it so well, um, it's essential. It's critical to life. Um, you know, I was looking at some statistics the other day. It's kind of interesting. You can go for about six minutes without air. You can go for about three and a half days without water. Um, you can go for 30 days without food, believe it or not. Um, you can only go about six days without sleep. So when you start to stack up, <laughs> you know, kind of like yeah. what's going on out there, yeah. sleep's a big deal. Yeah. Um, 
And I, I'm trying to educate people more on that because it's, it's kind of that throwaway thing that everybody does at the end of the day, right? It's like, eh, I'm going to go back to that place in the, in the back of my house or apartment. I'm going to close the blinds. I'm going to turn off the TV, hopefully, we'll see, um, and try to get some rest and come out maybe a, a better, maybe worse, who the heck knows. Um, what I've discovered over, my, over the course of time, especially looking at from an immunity perspective, is there's a really big difference between sleep disorders and what I call disordered sleep, okay? Yeah. So sleep disorders are formal um, situations like apnea or narcolepsy or um, restless leg syndrome. And by the way, I'm happy to answer questions about all of those today if that's uh, on people's minds. But the disordered sleep universe is really where I'd like to focus today because that's going to have the greatest effect on immunity and immune function in particular. Getting back to the basics of how does sleep affect the immune system, it's three different ways. So number one, what we now know is that sleep affects the production of what are called killer T cells. Um, so if you don't remember back to high school biology, um, killer T cells are the white blood cells that come in when there's an infection, a virus, or a threat to the host, which would be the human body. Mm -hmm. So what we always look for is increase in killer T cell production um, during those particular times. Sleep is actually one of the times when those, those cells are actually produced and made. So the more sleep you get, the greater concentration of killer T cells you have to, obviously the better chance you have to fight off infection, um, right. virus, disease, things of that nature. So that's number one. Um, number two, um, the timing of the sleep. So not necessarily just the amount, which seems to help with the killer T cells, but the timing of your sleep. Keeping yourself on a very consistent circadian rhythm turns out to have tremendous immune and overall bodily function effects. Your body just works better the more consistent you are. And, and bedtime is, plays a very, very big role in that. And we'll talk about that in just a second yeah, as well. Yeah. The third thing, which is really fascinating, is about two years ago, there was a really interesting study done um, in San Francisco. And so what they did was they took people who were sleep deprived, um, they uh, gave them the flu shot, then they exposed them to the flu. Then they took people who were not sleep deprived, um, gave them the flu shot and exposed them to the flu. Here's what happened, and I'm sure you know where I'm going with this, mm -hmm. is the people who were not well slept, yeah. almost 70% of them contracted the flu. The yeah. people who were well slept, less than 10% contracted the flu. Mm -hmm. So here, and to be fair, COVID is a little bit different than that particular scenario, but I think, yeah. we, can, I think we can make the stretch and say, look, we're all gonna eventually have to get inoculated um, with vaccines and things like that. And we can talk about vac vaccinations and whether you like them or you don't, that's a whole very controversial topic. Yeah. If you're not well slept, if you decide to get it and you're not well slept, it's not gonna be effective. Right. Um, and that's a big issue for people. So those three areas in general are the ones that I've been concentrating on and talking with people specifically about immune function and sleep and how is that relationship work. There's actually a fourth one that's um, fairly recent and that's actually melatonin. Um, so there's actually some very interesting data and I wanna be very clear about this. This is animal data only. So this is only data done in animal studies, not human studies, but what they've discovered is that um, melatonin appears to help balance something called a cytokine response. Mm -hmm. So um, what happens when the body becomes infected by a host depends upon what that host is. So it, it, with COVID, what it has a tendency to do is it has a tendency to increase these things called inflammatory cytokines. That's not a bad thing. We actually want that because it helps fight infection. The problem is it doesn't stop and it just right. keeps inflaming, yeah. inflaming, inflaming. Yeah. Interestingly enough, there have been three animal studies to show that melatonin helps balance that inflammation rise. And so it actually helps meter that or slow that down to the acceptable level. Because when it goes too high, you'd think, well, how bad could it be if I've got too much immunity? It's bad because it actually spills over and can affect lung function. And this is where we're seeing pneumonia um, and several of these other things happening for people that are, are, are really getting you know, crushed by this thing. Um, to be fair, um, the dosages of melatonin, we don't know what those would be, and we still don't know if, if it really would have a protective effect on an adult or not. But one of the things that's really interesting is if you look at melatonin levels in children, and you look at the number of children that are actually contracting COVID, it's very, 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 very the, the melatonin levels are high and the contraction level is quite low. Mm -hmm. So again, this is starting to give us some ideas as to what may happen. Hold off on buying you know, bottles and bottles of melatonin right now, because I'm not convinced that that's the way to go. I'm just trying to keep people informed 
um, within two to three weeks, I'll get back with Melissa and let her know because more research is going to be coming out if yeah. melatonin actually makes sense for yeah. you and then how to buy it and what to buy. Good. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Does All right. Sense, everybody? Yeah. In a nutshell, we need to be getting good sleep, ladies <laughs> and gents. <Yes. laughs> um, for those of you that, ju that just joined us, uh, I'm going to invite you to post your questions in the chat box. I'm going to ask yes, people to keep their lines muted just because uh, we don't want to have too much uh, background noise, but if you could post your questions in the chat box, if you have a question for Dr. Bruce, you know, please put that in there. Um, Dr. Bruce, before we get started, you had mentioned bedtime. Can yeah. you can you just talk talk about this? Um, yeah. You know, what what is the ideal time to be going to bed, and how much sleep? I mean, does it vary from person to person? I, I've read various studies that show yes. on average we need X amount. So can you comment on that? Absolutely, absolutely. So first of all, let me be clear. Eight hours is a myth. Okay. Let me say it one more time. Eight hours is a myth. Everybody needs their own individual amount of sleep. Okay. okay? To be clear, I go to bed around midnight. I wake up at about 6.20, 6.30 every morning without an alarm. I'm okay. the sleep doctor for God's yeah. sakes. And I get <laughs> six and a half hours of sleep, right? Yeah. So like, again, all bets are off. I don't use an alarm to, I don't, I don't have a, I, I have a tendency to get sleepy around midnight and I've never, I haven't used an alarm in 20 years. Okay. That actually turns out to be the thing that you kind of want to be able to do is allow your natural circadian rhythm yeah. to kind of come through. And what's great about being quarantined is you can actually do that. Yeah. Um, so there is, there is a positive to being quarantined for sure. And it comes yeah. in your sleep. Yeah. So being able to go to sleep, uh, when you're tired and wake up when you're not, when your body naturally wants to wake up, turns yeah. out to be where you're sleeping with what's called your chronotype. Mm -hmm. So you might not have heard the term chronotype, but you've probably heard of the concept if somebody's ever called you an early bird or right. a night owl or right. something like that. Right. Um, right. And as we age, one of the things we know is that we have a tendency to shift towards earlier times. Um, this actually has to do with melatonin production starting to lower as we age. And if you take that piece of information that I was talking about before, about how melatonin might be able to help balance these cytokine storms, this is when I start to talk with some of my patients, people who are over the age of 50, 55, about testing for their melatonin, seeing if they have you know, decent levels of melatonin, and then considering supplementation with mm -hmm. melatonin. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's very, very interesting when you look at the timing. Now, to be clear, I have a very simple experiment that people can do to figure out exactly uh, how much sleep they need and when to go to sleep. Okay. So when to go to sleep is actually very easy. If you go to, and uh, Melissa will put it in the, in the notes, um, chronoquiz.com. Um, it's, my, it's my website, so you're not going to some strange place. Um, and you just uh, put in your information, take a quiz. It's about a 30 question quiz. It will tell you which one of the four chronotypes you are and actually tell you this is the range in which you should be going to bed, when you should be eating, exercising, things like that. So it's, and it's completely free. It doesn't cost you a dime. Um, check it out. That's, that'll tell you when to sleep. The next question is, Michael, how much should I sleep? So here's the experiment that I have a tendency to run is I take my socially determined wake up time. So for all of you ladies and, and uh, gentlemen out there, it could be uh, what time you have to uh, get up for an appointment or your dogs or your animals get up or children, grandchildren, what have you. But there's something that's waking you up at a fairly consistent time, at least during the week. Right. So in our house, it's around 630. Like I told you before, I have a tendency to get up around 620 um, or so. And then my dogs wake up the second I wake up. So I have a whole routine <laughs> that, I, that I have to do. Um, but I know that 630 is kind of that anchor, right? So then what I do is I go backwards seven and a half hours. Michael, why would you do seven and a half hours? It turns out that the average sleep cycle is 90 minutes long and the average human has five of those sleep cycles. Mm -hmm. So five times 90 is 450 minutes divided by 60 is seven and a half hours. So if I'm playing the averages, mm -hmm. I start at 630, I go backwards by seven and a half. That makes my bedtime 11, right? Okay. So it's, it's very simple. So just take your morning wake up time, count backwards seven and a half hours, and mm -hmm. that's your starting point. Interesting. Okay? Now, here's the deal. I tried this experiment and it failed. And I'll tell you why. Now, you heard me say earlier, I go to bed at midnight. I don't right. go to bed at 11. So right. Michael, how, how did that kind of thing right. happen? So I went to bed at 11 and I woke up at 5.30 in the morning. Okay. I yeah. started, tried it a second night. I went to bed at 11. Again, I woke up at 5.30 in the morning. To be clear, the only thing I hate more than mornings are morning people 
You guys are just too damn chipper for me in the mornings. I am not that guy. I do not want to be awake at 5.30 in the morning. So I said, you know what? I'm just going to rotate my bedtime from 11 to 12 and see what happens. Yeah. I went to bed at 12, boom, I got up at 6.30. Yeah. So what we discovered is that my average sleep cycle wasn't 90 minutes. It was actually less, and that's going to vary across time. So remember, this is an experiment, right? Yeah. It's, you're, you're not going to nail it right out of the gates. Yeah. But you will start to discover, hey, here's when I should be sleeping, and here's about how much I should be yeah. sleeping. Once you dial that in, it should take you about seven days to figure that out. Once yeah. you dial it in, that's what you want to do, yeah. um, especially during COVID, because a lot of people like I, I, it was funny. I was watching. Um, I don't know if you, any, but any of you watch this television show in the morning. I like to watch headline news with Robin Mead. Um, mm -hmm. And um, and she got on. I was watching this morning. She was like, what day is it? You know, and it's like <laughs> I kind of can relate to that. Right. Yeah. It seems like every <laughs> single day is just a bunch of Zoom calls and, you know, whatever. And it just doesn't even feel like there's weekends anymore yeah, and days yeah. anymore and things like that. But keeping this consistent schedule, I can't impress upon you enough how important it is. And more importantly is the wake up time than the actual bedtime. So mm -hmm. even if you decide, hey, I'm going to stay up late tonight and watch Netflix until three o'clock in the morning. Great. Have a great time doing it. I still want you getting up at, this, at your normal bed, uh, wake up time. To mm -hmm. be fair, there's a, there's a window there, right? And so if you do stay up until four o'clock in the morning and your normal wake up is 630, I don't want you waking up at 630. Right. Get a minimum of six hours of sleep, okay. minimum, if you go cuckoo and stay up super late. But if you can, try to avoid doing that. Okay. Um, I mean, to be fair, Netflix is going to be there when you wake up the next day, Right. Right. <laughs> you know, right. Um, and we've all got plenty of time. So yeah. I, I would say if you really can keep that consistent wake up time, that's going to be important. Tip number two is avoid napping. This is a tough one, okay, because it's really easy. I don't know about uh, all of you, but I'm on Zoom call after Zoom call after Zoom call. My eyes are getting tired from staring at the screen so much. Yeah. So now I'm, I'm wearing my blue light blocking glasses to avoid the eye strain a little bit earlier nowadays. Yeah. That's been quite helpful. But, you know, sometimes it's in between calls and I'm like, man, I'm dragging. I think I'm going to go lie down on the couch for 15 minutes. Mm. Bad idea. Here's okay. why. When you nap, you lower your sleep drive. And so if you have any difficulty falling asleep at night and you nap, it's going to be a disaster when you try to do it. <laughs> um, so do yourself a favor. Try yeah. to avoid napping if you can. Now, to be fair, if you normally take a regularly scheduled nap, you can go ahead and do that. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But don't take an extra one or don't add a nap in there just because you feel like you might be a little sleepy. Mm. Better thing to do, walk outside. Mm. Okay. Get some sunlight, get some fresh air. We're all stuck indoors, but that doesn't mean we can't walk out onto our property using social distancing, all of that kind of stuff. Breathe in some fresh air, get some sunlight. Even if you, if you can't go outside, open up your windows and get the fresh air in. It's going to be helpful. It's going to give you that energy. You're probably not going to need to take that nap out. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. Um, a couple of other things that I've been telling people to do uh, um, in terms of a routine, um, especially before bed, about 90 minutes before you're going to bed, do yourself a favor, turn off CNN, turn off the news. You don't need to know how many people died today right before you go to bed. Right. Okay, oh. like there's no point in that, <laughs> you know. I was having nightmares actually. Well, and so that. this is this is what's interesting. So I'm doing a spot on the Today Show next week all about um, vivid dreams and anxiety that's coming mm -hmm. currently right now. And I'm telling you something: people need to put themselves on a media diet, right? Okay. So just slow down on the info. I promise it'll be there the next day. Yeah. Um, but there's data to show that whatever you're thinking about right before bed, you have a tendency to dream about. Mm -hmm. There's also data to show, and this is one of my favorite pieces of data to share, that if you're optimistic before bed, that you actually fall asleep more quickly and you have more positive dreams, mm -hmm. right? That's kind of cool, Michael. So what yeah. should we do about that? So I'm asking people to do fun things as they're falling asleep before bed. So one of my examples is create a gratitude list. Mm -hmm. You might not be familiar with this as a concept, but it's very powerful. Yeah. So right now it's a tough time for a lot of people, but being able to write down or just think about yeah. the things that you are grateful for. Maybe it's the roof over your head. Maybe it's somebody delivered something to your home. Uh, maybe it's just that the water is still running and the lights are still on. Mm -hmm. You'll be surprised, but having these positive thoughts before bed absolutely influence our ability to sleep. Other things besides a gratitude list. I've got some people um, so if they have a bed partner, they think about when this is over, what's the vacation we're going to take, 
Mm. Like, what cool place are we going to go yeah. or, or go visit a family member? And, and it's very interesting because it really brings up a lot of positive feelings. There's actually data to show that when people are thinking about a vacation, they actually get more benefit than actually taking the vacation. Yeah. Um, so I'm a big fan of spending time before bed thinking about positive things. Mm. Now, that also brings up a topic of, well, Michael, what about TV? right? Because lots and lots of people fall asleep with the television on. Yeah. I am the only sleep doctor in the universe that says it's okay to fall asleep with the television on. Really? Yes. Because yeah, yeah. someone had sent that question in, so I'm glad you're saying that. Sure they did. <laughs> so let's talk about it for a second. Yeah. Let's talk about how do you watch television before bed and what's the appropriate way to do something yeah. like that. So first of all, people always ask me, well, Michael, there's blue light coming from the television and that's going to affect my ability to fall asleep. True. However, it's literally across the room, number one. Um, number two, most people who say that they're watching TV to fall asleep are not watching. They're listening, right? So uh, we've had this discussion quite a bit in my home. So when I first met my wife, she said, Michael, if we ever have a sleepover, I need to let you know that I fall asleep with the television on. I said, oh, hon, don't worry about that. I'm going to fix that. I don't know about anybody out there, but if anybody has ever tried to fix something in their bed partner, I'd love to see a raise of hands of who's been successful <laughs> because it certainly has not been me, okay? <laughs> so I removed the television. She said, you can remove yourself. I then put yeah. the television back. And the television told, stays. <laughs> I was allowed back in the bedroom. Um, so I decided to study her to learn more about what, what she was doing. And she really mm -hmm. wasn't watching. She was listening to it. Yeah. One of the things she told me is she's like, you know, it helps distract my monkey mind. Right. Yeah. And look, the number one thing that people tell me is they can't turn off their brain yeah. um, to fall asleep. That's yeah. the number one thing. Yeah. And so, look, if television does that for you, I don't care. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Here's the thing. 99% of televisions have a timer built into the software. Go to the timer, figure it out, and just have it turn off after three hours. Hmm. It's really very yeah. simple. Okay. Yeah. Now, I will tell you that I'm not a big fan of using your telephones right? Before bed or, um, or iPads or laptops. And I'll tell you why. Number one, the proximity, the blue light's much closer. That's mm -hmm. number one. Yeah. Number two, if you're trying to get your high score on Candy Crush, you're really not trying to go to sleep, right? <laughs> you know, if you're ready to beat solitaire at that third, 300th level or whatever those yeah. things are called, again, you're not really setting your body up to be yeah. able to fall asleep. Right before bed is time for positive thought, prayer, meditation, relaxation, you name it. One of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to leave you guys with a website that you can go to. And I have a free downloadable progressive muscle relaxation audio that you can actually put onto your phone or onto your computer. And you can listen to in the dark before bed. And it will help you tense and relax your muscles from the top of your head to the tip of your toes. It's mm -hmm. one of my favorite things to just chill people out. Also, it's distracting because you're listening to, and it, I'll, I'll warn you, it's my voice. Um, you're listening to um, me give you these instructions and you're not thinking about the things that are making you think, right? And so that's kind of what we're trying to accomplish here is that level of distraction can be very, very helpful for people. Um, a couple other things that I want people to think about, alcohol. So there's a really big difference between going to sleep and passing out, okay? So we want to be careful with this. A lot of people are saying, hey, it's three o'clock someplace. I'm grabbing a glass of wine and finishing up my day. I don't have a problem with you, you, with you uh, it, drinking adult beverages. No problem with that whatsoever. You got to be smart about it when it comes to sleep. So here's what we know is alcohol, while it makes you feel sleepy, it actually prevents physical restoration, which occurs during sleep. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. That's part of the reason that people get a hangover, feel that fatigue after having had a few too many glasses of wine. So my recommendation is actually quite simple. Um, also, by the way, alcohol is a diuretic and it makes you have to go to the bathroom. So it will dehydrate you. Um, so that's something you have to be very careful about because sleep in and of itself is also a dehydrative event, meaning that when you fall asleep, you lose almost a full liter of water just from the humidity in your breath, just as you breathe out. And so think about it. You drink a couple of glasses of wine and it helps you fall asleep. Now you lose even, and of course you go to the bathroom three or four times, yeah. then you, you're losing all that water and you wake up. And what do a lot of people do? They grab a cup of coffee. Yeah. Right? Again, bad idea. Coffee's a diuretic. So you have a dehydrated body. You add a substance that bam, makes you even more dehydrated. Mm -hmm. So again, thinking through the routine of alcohol and caffeine and when to utilize those appropriately 
can be important, but I'm gonna give you the tips and tell you exactly how to do it. So step number one is if you're gonna drink alcohol, have one alcoholic beverage, drink one glass of water, and wait one hour. It mm -hmm. turns out that the human body will, uh, will digest a, a, a alcohol in one hour, one drink, one hour. If you have two glasses of wine, you're gonna drink two glasses of water and wait two hours. Three glasses, three drink gla uh, glasses of water, and three hours. If you go over three glasses of wine, there's a lot of things that can go wrong there, just to be clear. Number one, what we've discovered, especially in women in particular, is once you actually pass two glasses of wine, that relaxing effect that you get from alcohol no longer happens. In fact, you get an energizing effect. You actually feel more energy and ready to go out and kind of do things. That's not exactly what you would want to have happening in the latter parts of the evening. For men, what we see is when they go over three glasses of wine, spirits, beer, or whatever, the same thing happens. Their energy level increases and aggression increases. Mm -hmm. So again, this is not the time to see how high you can make your tolerance, right? It's not the time to say, hey, I'm going into the wine cellar and grabbing that old bottle of wine and, you know, let's have it all in one night. You want to have a glass of it? Go for it. I'm down with that. But what you don't want to do is drink the whole bottle. Mm -hmm. um, from the caffeine perspective, when you wake up in the morning, the last thing that you want is a cup of coffee. Although it might feel like you'll kind of want one. Better yet, go over to the window, get direct sunlight, and drink a bottle of water. Um, again, remember, you are completely dehydrated when you wake up. So yeah. adding water before caffeine will actually rehydrate your body and do something that's much more important than adding a diuretic and caffeine. Believe it or not, if you just wait 90 minutes after you open your eyes, so in my case, wake up at 6.30, at eight o'clock, I could have my first cup of coffee. What we discover is caffeine actually has more power when you wait 90 minutes. The reason is in order to pull your body out of a state of unconsciousness, you need two hormones, adrenaline and cortisol. So those are both very, very high. Well, if you add caffeine to a brain that already has this adrenaline and cortisol, it just doesn't really do a whole lot. But if you wait 90 minutes when all of those hormones start to go down and then you add the caffeine, it will actually lift those hormones and give you a bigger bang for your buck. Um, the thing to watch out for about caffeine on the other side, not the morning side, but the afternoon or evening side, is that a lot of people don't realize but caffeine has a half-life of six to eight hours. Mm -hmm. So if you stop drinking caffeine around two or three and you're going to bed around nine or 10, that makes a lot of sense. But if you start drinking caffeine later on into the day, it's going to make it more difficult for you to sleep. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm sure that there are several people who are on this call, and here's what you're thinking. Huh, sleep doctor, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I can have a cup of coffee at six o'clock in the evening, and I can go to sleep by you know, 8, 30, 9 o'clock, no problem, right? I'm sure you're out there. A couple of things I want to bring forward to you. Number one, people have different caffeine sensitivities. So there are some people that can handle caffeine a little bit later. But more importantly, if I put electrodes on your head after you had that late cup of coffee, even though you're able to fall asleep, the quality of that sleep is dramatically reduced. So we really have to be quite careful about understanding caffeine and, that, and those consumptions and things that are going on. The last tip I want to give everybody um, specifically to help avoid um, uh, COVID-19, obviously keeping a good schedule, avoiding alcohol and caffeine at the wrong times, um, believe it or not, is cleanliness. So a lot of people, you might not have somebody that's coming into your home to do housekeeping if that's what you do, or you might have, you know, because you're home, you've got a lot more stuff coming in. Wash your sheets. Wash them in super hot water. Wash them a minimum of once a week. That is where all of the buildup of the bacteria and things like that are going to start happening. I'm, uh, we're washing our sheets twice a week. So we pick, do like when, uh, Mondays and then we'll do Thursdays, right? And we'll just kind of run through that whole scenario. And it actually works quite well. Um, not saying anything about anybody's cleanliness, but be smart, right? You've got stuff on, you've got COVID can be on your clothes. It can be on a whole host of things. So you just want to be smart about that if you possibly can be. Um, but those are my major um, tips and recommendations. And then I, at this, I'm going to put in a website here that you guys can get all of these tips and more. Um, you just have to go to the sleep doctor uh, forward slash, uh, I think it's sleep hyphen pandemic. So I'm going to type it in here right now. But I'll open it up for questions if you want. Yeah, let's do that. Wow. So that, those are great tips. And what I'll do is I will summarize those tips uh, in the follow up email that we send out with this recording because there's a lot of information. So we're going to yeah. summarize it for everybody. That was awesome. 
And that was interesting. A lot of some of that stuff you shared, you know, challenges conventional wisdom. So it's absolutely, you know, it's interesting. And my husband will be really happy to hear about the TV because that's I'm like sure. a, that's a, that's a bone of contention in our house. So he's going to love that. Um, okay. So here's what I do. I see some people um, posting in the chat box. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, we're going to address those oh, first. Great. And again, if we still have people joining. So if you just joined, feel free to post your questions in the chat box and then I'm going to, you know, handle some of the questions that people sent in ahead of time. So feel free to, sure. you know, post your questions in there. So we've got a question here mm -hmm. um, from A. I don't know the full name. It says, how do you deal with having no problem falling asleep, asleep. but then being, being woken up with severe leg cramps several times during the night? So I'd like to address this question in two separate ways. One is just general awakenings in the night, and then one is specific to leg cramps because I'm not convinced that everybody out there has leg cramps, but I am convinced that a lot of people are waking up in the yeah. middle of the night. Yeah. Um, so I actually wrote a, a blog specific to this. Um, sorry, my printer's going off. Um, I wrote a blog specific to this about three things that wake you up in the middle of the night and what to do about it. That's going to be something that, um, and we'll uh, actually, Melissa, let's make sure that we post that as well. We can send that as a link. Um, but when you look at um, waking up in general, there's a couple of key things that you're going to want to do. So number one is don't look at the clock. Um, everybody wants to look at the clock. The problem is you instantly do the mental math and then you're angry, right? Because you're like, oh crap. It's three o'clock in the morning. I'm get, the sun's coming up at six. I'm not, I didn't sleep really well. Sleep, sleep, sleep. And you try really hard to sleep, right? It never works. What happens is you cause a significant amount of what's called autonomic arousal, meaning your body starts, starts to turn on. So the sleep system is called the parasympathetic system. The sympathetic system is your activation system. The second that you look at the clock and you do the math and you get angry, you activate. Um, and the sympathetic takes over, not the parasympathetic. So that's not good. So number one, if you do wake up in the middle of the night, don't look at the clock. Number two, if you don't have to pee, don't. Um, lots of people say, well, I'm up. I might as well go to the bathroom. Here's the thing that most people don't understand is when you go from a lying down position to a seated to a standing position, your heart rate increases. You need a heart rate of 60 or below in order to enter into a state of unconsciousness. So when you stand up and you walk around, to be fair, you're not going to have that heart rate. So then you have two issues. Then you, you're awake and now you got to lower your heart rate. Better if you stay lying in bed. Again, if you got to go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom. I get it. But if you don't really have to go, chill out and relax. Um, this meditation uh, that I'm going to be giving everybody is something that you could be listening to to help relax yourself or doing what I call four, seven, eight breathing. Mm -hmm. So four, seven, eight breathing is a technique that was developed by the military. It's incredibly effective and it dumps your heart rate very, very quickly. Um, on the, on the sleep pandemic website, you'll see a, a method of doing it, but it's exactly what it sounds like. You breathe in for a count of four, you hold it for a count of seven and you breathe out for a count of eight. Now I'll be fair. It's not easy to do. You're going to have to get used to it. Do it five to seven times and it will almost immediately drop your heart rate, which will be great. Yeah. It's one of my favorite all yeah. overall techniques and it's free, right? I mean, it's easy. Like yeah. you just yeah. breathe. Yeah. Um, so I think that's certainly something that you can be doing in the middle of the night. Leg cramps in particular have got some other potential issues to them. So there's a couple of different things that I'm always looking for when I hear somebody has leg cramps. The biggest one is a potassium or a sodium deficiency. So I would want to know and understand, hey, have you had your potassium and sodium looked at? Because sometimes that can cause leg cramping in the middle of the night. Um, believe it or not, a banana um, before bed is not the worst idea. Number one, it's loaded with magnesium, um, which can be very helpful for both leg cramps and potassium. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, the banana can be, has potassium. Magnesium does not have potassium in it unless you get the mixture. Um, but my favorite little recipe that you can do is called banana tea. So you take an organic banana and you just wash it off. It turns out that most of the magnesium isn't in the fruit, it's in the peel. No, I'm not asking you to eat the peel. Take the banana, wash it off, cut it in half, leave the fruit in and the peel on it, and put it into three cups of boiling water. All I'm asking you to do is boil a clean banana with the skin on. That's the whole recipe. Okay? <laughs> Take that and then you drink the water. It's loaded with potassium, loaded with magnesium. It's very banana flavor. Um, mm -hmm. As my daughter likes to say, dad, it's really banana-y. Um, <laughs> that's how she puts it. Um, so you got to like bananas. Yeah. Um, but what's great about it is it doesn't interact with any medications. It's safe for seniors, for children, for everybody. I mean, it's banana water, right? I mean, that's all yeah. it is. 
but yeah. it's just loaded with great magnesium and most of us are magnesium deficient. So that can be something that can be yeah. very helpful for people as well. Um, I see a question here by Joey that asks, how do you test for melatonin levels? Yeah. So since we're talking about deficiencies and things like that, I'm going to go ahead and, and answer that one as well. Um, so believe it or not, you can do, there are saliva tests that you can do for melatonin. There are blood tests that you can do for melatonin. There's even kits that you can order to your home and uh, understand what your melatonin levels are. But be smart about it. Remember, melatonin works on a circadian rhythm, so it goes up and down throughout the day. So when you collect your sample is going to have a dramatic effect on what the level is that it's going to see, right? So with many of the melatonin kits, the thing that you wanna look for is multiple samples throughout a 24 hour cycle. So you would have take one when you wake up, you might take one around like one o'clock lunchtime, you might have one at seven o'clock at night, you might even have one in the middle of the night, depending upon exactly what you're trying to track. So if you're trying to test your melatonin, there's definitely some, uh, some things out there that are available to do that. Awesome. Yeah, there was another question that someone had sent in and to, they were asking, uh, this is from Lori, she wants to know how much, if someone is, wants to use melatonin to help them sleep at night, right. um, how much, what's the best form, you yes. know? Absolutely. So here's the thing. Remember, melatonin is not a sleeping pill. It's not a sleep initiator. Melatonin is a sleep regulator. Melatonin tells your brain it's bedtime. It does not make your brain sleepy. Those are two different processes in the brain. Melatonin is great for people if they have jet lag, if they're traveling from time zones. If you think that you might have what's called social jet lag or you're having a difficult time with your schedule being varied all over the place, melatonin could be helpful in helping create parameters mm. for that. A couple things you need to remember. Melatonin is a hormone. It's not a mineral, it's not a vitamin, it's a hormone. So it can actually react with other things that are going on in your body. Specifically, if you're on blood pressure medication, for example, ACE inhibitors can be dramatically affected. Um, their effectiveness can be affected by melatonin. So if you're taking blood pressure medication, melatonin is not a great idea for you. Uh, same thing if you're pregnant. Um, melatonin can have effects on the unborn fetus. We don't know exactly what those effects are, but why would you ever risk it? So if you or a friend is, uh, is trying to get pregnant, melatonin is not a great idea. Let's look at dosage of melatonin for a second because that's always a big question and concern. The truth of the matter is there was a study that was done about two years ago where they pulled 15 bottles of melatonin just off the grocery store shelf. Not one of them had the same dosage on the label that was in the bottle. Not one. There were overs and there were less. Wow. So first of all, you gotta have a trusted source to get your melatonin from. I found one, I'm gonna give Mel the link so you guys can go and get it if that's something that you wanna get. Yep. Number two is the dosage is important. You would wanna use somewhere between a half and one and a half milligrams. That's it. 95% of the melatonin that I found is in three, five and 10 milligram dosages, overdosing. Once again, this is when side effect profiles come about. This is when interaction effects come about. So it's no bueno, right? But it's not what we want people doing. Mm -hmm. Also, if you're gonna take it in a pill format, it's gotta go in, get digested, and then come back up. That's gonna take about 90 minutes, right? So again, you don't use melatonin like a sleeping pill. If you, if you were prescribed a sleeping pill like Ambien or something like that, you would take it and turn out the light because that's how those drugs work. Melatonin doesn't work that way at all. Melatonin, you would need to take 90 minutes before you were gonna take out the light or turn out the light rather. So uh, I have an extensive blog um, about melatonin on my website. So we'll also uh, make that available for everybody. Yeah, definitely. Well. Great question. Um, and uh, Lori has another question. She said, if your bedroom is pitch black, what do you suggest for safety in the middle of the night um, to use the restroom? Absolutely. So I have, um, so there's two things. One of them is quite humorous and one of them is very practical. So I have night lights that I have um, one in the bathroom and one on my way to the bathroom. So that way I don't have to flip on the lights and go anywhere. Believe it or not, there's a company that makes slippers. And when you put your feet in and push down, little lights come from the front and you can walk. And it's like these little, it's hilarious. Um, I can't remember what they're called. Like this, go to Google and type in light up slippers. I swear to you, they're there. They're like 20 <laughs> bucks. It's hilarious. Um, but it's kind of a fun little thing that people yeah. can use to, yeah. to be able to get where they need to go. Yeah. Okay. That's a great tip. Good to know. I've never heard of that. And again, if you're just logging in, please feel free to post your questions in the chat box. I'm going to keep fielding some of these questions here that people sent in. Um, so this question is from uh, Corinne. She says mm -hmm. that she's a nurse. She works 
7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Oh. <laughs> Three days a week. Okay. 7 P to 7 A. That sucks. Yeah. Man. Yeah. That's okay. She's, she takes trazodone mm -hmm. um, at a local, she buys it from a local grocery store. Mm -hmm. You can't she buy trazodone. That's a prescription. Oh, she says, I take trazodone a, a Kroger. Is that? She a, probably gets it from the Kroger pharmacy. Okay. Gotcha. She says it's a Kroger sleep aid. And then um, she, she says she takes it on her days off to get to sleep. Mm -hmm. And then she says, I take the same thing. Um, to sleep during the day when I'm working, but I can't seem to get four to five hours, uh, more than four to five hours of sleep when I'm trying to, you know, basically reset my sleep cycles. Any suggestions? Yep. Okay, so just to be fair, this is a complicated question yeah. and yeah. it's a complicated issue. Yeah. Um, it's, I, I'm happy to answer it maybe offline um, okay. because I'm not convinced that everybody here would need to know about okay. it. But to be fair, I, I would like to, to address a couple of the issues, Kareen, that I think everybody sh should know and hear yeah. about. So number one, working from 7P to 7A is terrible. Yeah. Um, it's not good for your yeah. body. The data is very, very consistent. Yeah. I can totally appreciate that it's time and a half or double time working yeah. at night. I can totally appreciate that 90% of, of nursing staff gets stuck on the night shift because nobody wants the night shift. And then they, they kind of have to live there for a while or because of the dollars, they want those shifts. I completely understand where you're coming from. And let's be fair, I think it's something like 17 or 18% of the workforce works on a different shift yeah. than everybody else. So there's a tremendous number of people out there who are doing this. Yeah. I'm actually working on an app that will actually, where you can plug in your shift and it will tell you exactly when to take your melatonin, when to nap, when to use light, wow. uh, all of those things. Um, it's not ready for prime time yet. I'm thinking, we're, we're thinking in about six to seven months, we should be there. Um, we already have it for jet lag. It's called Time Shifter, T-I-M-E-S-H-I-F-T-E-R. Um, you can go to the app store and check it out. Um, that one's specifically for uh, jet lag, um, but we are developing one for sh shift work. So the good news for Kareen is hold on. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and also uh, as a nurse, we all want to say thank you yes. um, for the time and the energy and, and all of that you are doing during this very difficult time. Uh, while I might not know you personally, I know your field and um, the nurses are the people that are driving this a hundred percent. There's no question in my mind, the doctors are almost superfluous um, mm -hmm. in many of the cases. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you for what you're doing. And if you can get good sleep, please try to do so. Melatonin is probably something that could be helpful for you on your days off as well as your days on. And again, I'm happy to connect with you afterwards to talk. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So this question just came in from Lorraine. She says, you mentioned to wash your sleep, your sheets twice a day or twice a week. Um, I shower before bed at night. So do I still need to change them that often? Probably not. If you're a, if you're a nighttime shower, like as an example, my daughter likes to take her shower at night. And here's the best part, Lorraine, is if you, if you do this the right way, you can actually use your nighttime shower as a sleep promoter. So it turns out that if you raise your core body temperature about 90 minutes before bed, it helps with melatonin production. Mm. It's very interesting. So take a nice hot shower or better yet, take a bath, specifically a bubble bath. Because bubbles, when they lay across the water, keep the, they form a layer of insulation and they actually keep the water hotter longer. Uh -huh. Interesting. Um, so Mr. Bubble is definitely your friend um, <laughs> when it comes to, to nighttime sleep. Um, and so if you take a bubble bath, um, but what's great about that is you raise that core body temperature and then when you get out of the bath, the temperature falls. And that falling is actually a signal to your brain to release melatonin. Um, so I love the fact that you shower at night. If you want to switch up and do a lavender bath every once in a while, you are going to sleep like a stone. Mm. Um, and, if you, and if you do shower each night, you probably don't need to wash your sheets twice a week. Right. Yeah. That's a great question. I'm a nighttime shower too. So um, I'm glad that she asked that. Okay. This question is from Shaz. I'd like to know about natural supplements for an overactive mind. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple of different things out there that we can talk about supplements for an overactive mind. Um, so one of the things I don't know, uh, Melissa, is uh, what state is everybody in? Physically, we got people from all over. <laughs> I'm in New okay. Hampshire. Yeah, but if people want to share where they're calling in from, feel free to post that in the chat box. Where's everyone calling in from? Let's see where people are coming in from. And, and I have a very specific reason why I asked that question at this particular time. Okay. Oh, Philly, New Hampshire, oh, Boston, California. Oh, great. Okay, perfect. Ontario. 
Amazing. Okay. Oh, with Texas. Wow. You've got a real international group here. <laughs> or international, I should say, uh, U.S. group here. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, no, we got, we had a Ontario. I wonder if that's Ontario, California or Ontario, Canada. Well, yes. We do have some, Can we have quite a few Canadians actually join our call. Amazing. I love it. <laughs> so, so here's the reason that I asked this is because one of my favorite supplements for sleep is cannabis. And I'll tell you why. There's a lot of data looking at the effects of cannabis for sleep, specifically for shutting down your brain. Um, so when people are talking about, I can't turn off my brain at night, I have discovered that there are certain constituents within cannabis. And to be fair, I didn't discover it. I've just read the literature on it um, that I think can be very helpful. In particular, CBN, not CBD, CBN, like Nancy, is really the thing that is showing the most promise for sleep. CBD, you'd have to take almost two hundred milligrams a night before you start to see any real sleep effects, depending upon how you metabolize things and things like that. CBN, much lower dosage, um, something to think about. If you are considering using cannabis to help you sleep, I wrote an entire uh, 1500 word article on things that you should think about, and that's on the blog, so we can have that on there as well. Um, Non-cannabis related supplementation that can be helpful for turning off your brain at night, um, GABA. So one of the biggest ones that I've, I've been able to find is that GABA, G-A-B-A, -A, seems to help with that quite a bit. Unfortunately, GABA is made by a lot of different people, and the quality of GABA in many cases is not so great. There is one called Pharma GABA, P-H-A-R-M-A -A, GABA, and it's fantastic. The sterility standards are amazing. The quality of this stuff is really good. So I like Pharma GABA for that. Other um, supplements that are, are actually pretty good for shutting down that anxiety that seems to be happening before bed um, is uh, magnolia bark and jujubicide, um, are also known as jujube. These are supplements. Um, I've written about both of these on my blog as well. And I've, I do, I've done what's called a, mono, a, 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 what's it called? a monograph. So I've literally told you the dose based on your age, like everything that you would ever want to know about those supplements, both GABA, magnolia bark. Um, what was the other one? Juju beside. That's all on my blog as well. So that okay. that can be helpful information for you guys. Okay, that's helpful. And then the, the CBD. Oh, wait, I have one more. Sure. So there's a new thing out that I'd like to tell people about that's not a supplement, but actually works on turning off your brain, which is really cool. It's called EBB. E -B -B. So this is going to sound weird, but the data on it is staggering. It, it's a it's a device that you wear across your head, and it actually cools your skull. And the, what they've discovered is by cooling the brain, it slows that thinking process down. So there's no supplement, there's no pharmacy. It's literally cooling your brain with this, with this really interesting device. Now the data on this is pristine. This is an FDA approved device. This is not some snake oil that somebody out there is saying, hey, stick an ice cube on your head and fall asleep type of thing. Like this is solid science. This has been 15 years in the making. I know the researcher um, that has done it and his science is spectacular. So it's another thing that people can think about as an option for turning off your brain. Awesome, cool. Where do people get the CBN? Do you have a, a, a resource? You can get it at any dispensary. So if you're, if you're in a state like New Hampshire, I believe where it's uh, legal or California, um, if you just talk to the, your blood tender there and ask them for a sleep related um, uh, item that has CBN in it. I will tell you one of my favorite right now is called Drift Away. Um, this is a product that has melatonin, lavender, chamomile, and THC and CBN in it. So mm -hmm. it's, it's just, it's really well done. I'm, I'm pretty impressed with it as well. Awesome. Good stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, someone was asking about watching TV in bed. So we, we, we kind of addressed that, um, your, your comments on that. So I'm going to skip that one. Okay. Um, all right. This is a great one. Snoring. What do you do when your husband snores all night? Yes. Disrupt yes. your sleep. <laughs> That's not an easy one. Um, yeah. so, so let's talk about that for a second. So first of all, um, the very first thing I always tell all of my uh, patients who have a snoring bed partner or who snore themselves is losing about 5% of your body fat uh, or your body weight is, is really recommended. Uh, it's not like you have to lose 50 pounds, okay? If you're a 200 pound you know, person, if you, if you lost 10 pounds, what you'd notice is the decibel change by about 30 decibels, which is significant, especially when there's a person whose head is right next to your head. <laughs> um, so that's number one, is weight loss can be certainly helpful. Number two, there actually is a device that I use um, when I snore that's very effective. It's called Mute, M-U-T-E, like hit the mute button. 
Um, it's available at Walgreens. It's 14 bucks. It's an internal nasal dilator. So it's actually something that goes inside the nostrils. So I use it if I drink alcohol. Um, so my wife tells me, like, if I've had a couple of beers, she's like, go put your nose thingy in because um, I don't want to listen to you snore all night. And it works like a charm. Okay. Um, there are some mouth guards that are, uh, that are, some are more effective than others. The only one that I've seen any clinical data on is called the Zipa. Um, it's happy Z spelled backwards. It's the stupidest name I've ever heard, um, but it's called the Zipa. And um, I know the guy that invented it. The commercials are terrible, but the device really works. <laughs> they just um, need so, a little bit of marketing. <laughs> yeah, they need so much help in marketing. It's unbelievable. <laughs> All right, so we have just just a few minutes here. Um, I want to be respectful of your 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 time, Dr. Bruce. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna take a couple more questions. Um, that people, I'll I'll ask some of the questions that people said in. Uh, if anyone on the line has a question, now's the time. You know, put it in Fire the chat box. Fire away. You got the expert here. Um, Okay, is it possible to get too much sleep? How do you know, you know, when you're oversleeping? We kind of talked about this before, kind of listening to your body's natural, right. but how do you know like if you're overdoing it? So here's the good news is your body kind of won't let you overdo it. Like okay. it'll just wake up if you've gotten enough sleep. Here's okay. the thing is if you find yourself saying, oh, I want to sleep a little bit more, and you've already slept six, seven, eight hours, and you're right. thinking, man, I'm still not doing well, yeah. You don't have a quantity problem. You have a quality problem. Ah. Okay. And that's where things like alcohol, caffeine, consistency are going to be dramatically, dramatically important for you. Yeah. Um, so what I tell people all the time is if they say, gosh, Michael, I feel like I need nine, 10 hours of sleep. Number one thing I ask about is depression, right? Because lots of people, depression can manifest itself in people saying, I don't, I'm fatigued. I'm tired. I don't want to, you know, deal. And so they, they, they get sleepy. So that's number one. Number two thing I look for is sleep apnea. Um, especially since we just talked about snoring, just because you snore doesn't mean you have apnea, but almost everybody that has apnea snores. So if you are listening to your snoring bed partner and you notice that they pause for brief periods of time, even though that's great that they're not snoring anymore, it could mean that they've stopped breathing. Um, so it's a serious situation. It's not, uh, it can be deadly over time, but they're not going to die right there. Um, but if you do hear your, you or your bed partner stop breathing or they wake up choking or gasping, get a sleep study. And to be fair, during COVID, you can get a home-based sleep study. So it can be sent to your home. You apply the equipment yourself, then you send it right back. It's not a problem. Um, and it's very easy to do. Um, so the good news is, is your body won't allow you to sleep more than you really need. But if your body's asking you for more sleep, then you want to look at the quality of the sleep that you're getting. One final uh, point to make is if you contract COVID, all bets are off. Sleep as much as you possibly can. Sleep is healing, that's what your body needs to do. Don't try to put yourself on a sleep schedule if you've contracted COVID. You need to stay in bed, you need to rest. Great, awesome, awesome. What about, um, what about when your partner doesn't go to the bed at the same time? Mm -hmm. Be thankful, um, because then they're not disrupting you, right? <laughs> um, look, at the end of the day, there are people who have different, what we call chronotypes. So early bird versus night owl. You, yeah. I mean, you guys are going to be taking the quiz. Um, some people are fortunate. They ended up uh, having a bed partner that has the same schedule as them. Some people, not so much. Um, you don't have to go to bed together to have a good relationship, yeah. just to be clear. Yeah. Many people are like, but I love going to bed and snuggling in with my partner. Great. I, I, I'm sure that's fantastic. You're in quarantine. You see your partner as much as you ever could possibly want to right now. Go to bed at the time that you're tired. Let them go to bed yeah, at the time that's them tired and everybody's happy. Yeah. Awesome. I like that. All right. We'll do one more. Uh, what about pets? What are your thoughts about letting? Absolutely. This is another area my, my husband and I kind of disagree. So I'm curious to see what your thoughts are. All right. Are. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what, what happens in my house. So I'm here. My French bulldog is here. <laughs> Wawa is there, my wife is here, and then the cat is usually by her feet, okay? That's a full that's, bed. <laughs> that's our house. It's a king, to be fair. It's a king-size bed. I'm not a, I'm not a big guy. I'm about 150 pounds, so yeah. I, we've got a lot of room in there for, for all these other creatures. So here's the deal with animals in bed is it depends upon the animal, and it depends upon how disruptive they are. Our dogs sleep. Like, they're in, they're done, they basically hibernate. I mean, do they wake up at around 6.30? Yeah, that's about the time that I get up, so that doesn't bother me. The real problem comes when you've got an animal that's either large, um, that wants to sleep in their bed with you, or disruptive throughout the night. Yeah. 
So again, I've got a 24 pound dog, a four pound dog and a 12 pound cat. So none of that is going to be a big deal. But like I met somebody who asked me, is it okay if my great Dane, I kid you not, great <laughs> Dane sleeps in the bed with me. I was like, are you effing crazy? Like, really? Like, like is, that, is that a real question for me? You know? And it was like, but I, oh, and here was the kicker is they had a twin. They had a twin size bed. Like, <laughs> like, that's what they wanted to do. Like, not a twin twin, but like a twin size bed. I'm like, yeah. What? Yeah. Like, you've got a strange relationship with your Great Dane if you want to sleep with them in a twin size bed. Let's just leave it at that. Yeah, well, That's the your, yeah, the dog like, needs its own bed. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And generally speaking, if the animal's disruptive, train you can train them to either sleep on a part of the bed or off the bed. Um, uh, cats in particular, I don't know what that thing is where they're like making muffins all night. They're like kneading the dough on your pillow by your head. It makes me crazy, but that's what they do. Yeah. Um, so again, if it's disruptive, try to remove it. If it's non disruptive, it's not a problem. Yeah. All right. I'm going to ask one, one more question, one personal yeah. question. So as I was saying before, with all the, the news, you know, stuff, I, I was actually having nightmares, like you were saying before, and I don't have issues with nightmares ever. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed like the last three weeks, my dreams have been very vivid. Yes. Um, and so I've been mindful of, of what I watch before bed. So I really, but are there additional, and I do meditate before bed. Do you have additional tips to kind of manage that better? Because I feel like yeah. I'm not as rested because I'm having those vivid dreams. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is where that positive influence right before bed can be extremely helpful. So this is the time where adding the gratitude list or thinking yeah. about upcoming vacations, or I've got one couple, they actually break out a different photo album each night um, and look through when their kids were growing up and grandchildren and like, it's just a fun, positive time for them. That yeah. seems to be shifting their dreams. There is, however, a, a formal nightmare and dream therapy that's available. Dr. Barry Krakow at the University of New Mexico developed a, a technique which is marvelous. Um, I'll describe it to you now, but it's, you can find it online. What he does is he has you write out extensively every aspect of the dream that you can possibly remember, even the bad stuff, like somebody's after me and they're gonna you know, hit yeah. me with a hammer or whatever, and then the very end, you flip it so that you become the victor uh -huh. as opposed to the victim, mm. right? And so instead of somebody hitting you with a hammer, you hit them with the hammer. And you change that in the story. <laughs> and then believe it or not, you read the story three or four times just before bed. And within three to seven days, it changes the dream. Interesting. Okay. Pretty cool. <laughs> That's very cool. All right. I know we just had another. Do you have, do you have time for one more, Dr. Yep. Bruce? Sure. Um, so the, qu the question from Wendell, we already addressed uh, a similar question, Wendell. So I'll encourage you to listen to the recording about what to do when you wake up in the middle of the night. But um, oh, also, Wendell, we're going to give you a blog that addresses that very yeah, question as well. Yeah, we'll give you the link to that. Um, so this is, uh, it says, Jeff, uh, does CBD with THC, THC from, from help, help with states and where cannabis yeah. is not legal? It does, but you need a boatload of it. Um, you're looking at 150 to 200 milligrams of CBD to really help you with uh, sleep. Um, at least that's what the literature is saying uh, when it's derived from hemp. Um, so you're, you're not going to see the benefits. You will see the benefits for inflammation um, much earlier mm -hmm. than uh, in terms of dosage uh, than you would with, uh, with sleep in particular. Um, unfortunately, CBD has been touted as the miracle for literally everything. And I, I would be, it would be uh, irresponsible of me to turn to you and say, go for, you know, getting CBD. I just, I don't think it's got enough oomph for the, uh, there's not enough juice for the squeeze, I guess is the best way to put it. Yeah. Awesome. Yay. This was awesome. This went by so fast. It was so oh, fun. It yeah. So thank you so much for being here. So we're going to get those links out. Um, so the chrono quiz, we want yep. people to take that to figure out uh, the mm -hmm. best, that was the best uh, time to go to sleep. That's right. That's the best time yeah. to go to sleep. And then all of my COVID tips, as well as um, a free downloadable audio file for you to learn about progressive muscle relaxation is at thesleepdoctor.com forward slash sleep hyphen pandemic. But okay. I think I put that in there, but we'll make sure that everybody knows. Yeah, that. we'll make sure. I'm going to copy it too. I'm going to make sure that we put that in the email. Well, thank you so much for your time today, yeah. Dr. Bruce. I know you're a busy guy, so we appreciate it. It's crazy. And, uh, we'll have to have you back again. I would absolutely love it. And if you want to follow me on Facebook, um, I'm also giving out a lot of different tips there. It's just um, The Sleep Doctor is my handle there.
the sleep doctor and your, and your website again is just the sleep doctor. Sleep doctor. Com. Com. And doctors Perfect. all spelled out. So it's super easy to remember. Yeah. Awesome. And we got, it was a good URL. Yeah. All right. We'll have a fabulous day. Everyone stay safe and well, and that's uh, absolutely take care. Thanks again. Take care. Bye now. All right. Bye-bye.